Welcome, Climate Viewers. It's Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News at climateviewer.com. Yesterday, I put out a video and we're talking about this secret ionospheric heater up in uh, Kola Peninsula in Russia that was mentioned in the scientific article. Couldn't figure out where it was. Wanted to make sure that my list was thorough. And now I feel pretty good that we have our solution. Um, what a day a difference, uh, what a difference a day makes. Um, we're going to get into all the details. Um, I'm going to rip through this pretty rapidly. Uh, if you'd like to support these videos, please go to connect.climateviewer.com. You can see all of my material, um, all of the websites that I have, my three main websites. You can support me on Patreon, PayPal, GoFundMe. Grab some merch from the merch shop. New merch coming soon. Um, see all of my videos on YouTube, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, Discord, chat, Facebook, Twitter. I'm also on Getter. I'm working out the other um, social platforms, and those will be coming soon. So <clears throat> some of you may not even know what the Norway spiral is. We're going to just take a step back and see how we got here. So an individual, um, Biting Monarch, sent me his article, and he was trying to track down the source of the Norway spiral. So the problem that we had was we wanted to figure out were there ionospheric heaters involved in what this phenomena was that we saw. So in 2009, Barack Obama was receiving the Nobel Pre Peace Prize in Geneva when this spiral appeared in the sky. Just to refresh everybody's memory, if you didn't see it, it looked like this. Bad sound, no sounds. And as you can see, this big blue spiral in the sky, everybody was freaking out. Um, and of course, in 2009, the cameras weren't as good as they are today. That's a simulated shot, obviously not a real shot. Um, but there were a whole lot of people freaking out because, you know, as the conspiracy side goes, and <laughs> best exemplified on this MUFON video, um, a lot of people were speculating that it was like some kind of freaking uh wormhole um <laughs> so you know you, you you go ahead is was it a wormhole they say and they go into the the reasons why and the reason why they thought that is because at the end of this spiral um this black hole appears as you can see here and a lot of people freaked out about this i was certainly fascinated by this this was right about the time um you know that i had started doing my videos so um of course i i paid attention to this and, and followed it pretty closely and a lot of people did um but now we know a lot more about this sort of thing and i want to make clear a couple points on this that you know first of all what we saw can easily be attributed to rocket exhaust um Sounding rockets, which I've covered in many videos, I, I used to call them chemtrails from space. But basically, uh, like the Black Brant, Black Brant rockets, uh, sounding rockets that we launch from um, Poker Flat Research Range up in Alaska, um, off the coast of Virginia, at Wallops. Um, you know, these things, they happen all the time. Sounding rockets dump aluminum, barium, strontium, and uh, lithium in the upper atmosphere, and they trace them. They fluoresce or they, um, they illuminate when they hit some solar rays and they're up and the chemical reactions happen. I have a great shot of that on climateviewer.com if you want to check that out. Um, this was from 2019 project Azure sounding rocket chemtrails from space. And, um, the colors look pretty similar. Don't you think to what we were seeing here in this, uh, in these shots, let's see if we can go back just a little bit. Um, you know, this, this blue and, you know, gray swirls that we're seeing. Um, maybe I'll go back to this one real quick. But you can see it pretty clearly here. Um, you know, it was blue. It was silver. It was spiraling. It was a rocket spiraling out of control. Um, and here's what it actually looks like when um, 
one of these sounding rockets goes off, I'll scroll down here and I will hit play. Uh, did I, did I, I did, I did. I let that keep playing. So anyway, we'll go to right here and now in five times playback speed. So right here we see the barium coming out and the strontium followed by trimethyl aluminum coming out here at the bottom. That's the colors that you're seeing in, right there in the screen. Barium release comes out green, turns blue. Followed by trimethyl aluminum. These are probes coming from the sounding rocket. They drop these and then they leave trails. And as you can see by the colors, that's what the Norway spiral was. It was chemical release from rocket exhaust. This is what the spiral looked like after the, what you just saw in that video. This is what it looked like maybe an hour or two later. So, um, and I actually got these from the webcams at the launch site. Um, and you can see that blue, those blue dots basically had, you know, purple dots from the barium um, had, you know, exp expanded into a pretty large cloud. And then as you get lower in the atmosphere, the winds blow them around. And this is a tracer, okay? So the idea is that you're basically able to see the invisible. Wind is invisible. So you wouldn't be able to see any of this if they didn't dump these chemicals up there. This is their explanation for why they do it. Do I agree with it? No. Do I like it? No. I think that the idea is probably poisonous. They swear, you know, hey, it's just a small amount, blah, 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 blah. Um, but that's why I've been fascinated by this for over a decade. Um, but it does explain the Norway spiral. Um, and it does lend credence to the, you know, explanations that have been given Norway spiral video mystery solved. Um, you know, was it a UFO, a stargate style wormhole opening path to other galaxies? Was it the Aurora Borealis? Um, or was it the Russian defense ministry saying that they fired a bull of a, um, a nuclear missile, um, multi-stage nuclear missile from a submarine, um, that spiraled out of control. So because um, rockets tend to have aluminum, a lot of aluminum in their, you know, fuel, um, that's going to react with the upper atmosphere. That's going to cause that blue and gray tints that you're seeing in the spiral. Um, their explanation was that one of the rocket engines was not properly firing. So if that happens, you get a rocket that's going to spin and spin and spin, and eventually it runs out of fuel and all that expands you get the black circle okay you got a notification captain tom i'm mind blown that never happens so something's wrong with the google algorithm today um in guam bro you're surrounded by freaking nsa facilities and radars my um as we'll get to in just a moment um rsm 56 boliva um nuclear uh you know bl ballistic missile okay so this was their explanation of what went wrong that you know the solid fuel from the um the rocket was what did that um as an example whenever the space shuttle would launch those solid rocket boosters on the side would produce more than 300 tons of aluminum oxide per launch this would cause acid rain that would melt the launch pads down in on Florida. There's no joke. Um, but 300 tons of freaking aluminum oxide per rocket booster. So you can only imagine out of a ballistic missile, um, the amount of aluminum being sprayed in the upper atmosphere. So, um, yes, I do know about Guam. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can only imagine living there, brother. Um, but this is what what prompted this whole video. Um, you know, the, the guy reached out to me about the Norway spiral, said, does it have anything to do with HARP? Um, and then he mentioned this, uh, you know, this uh, scientific paper that talks about 
Um, the Polar Geophysical Institute and Kola Scientific Center and the Russian Academy of Sciences, blah, 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 and Murmansk over last Russia. And in it, um, they say right here that later some ionospheric heaters were applied for investigation of high latitude ionosphere owing to their location high latitudes, namely near Manchegorsk Kola Peninsula. Tromso, Scandinavia, Fairbanks, Alaska, Gakona, Alaska. So that's the Tromso ionospheric heater, the high pass um, ionospheric heater in Fairbanks, which is closed, and Gakona, Alaska, which is HARP. And long year beyond um, Svalbard. Um, I showed Svalbard. I showed all three of those in the last video. Um, we'll probably should, you know rehash that in just a second. Um, but, you know, I was looking for this one in particular because they mentioned um, a ionospheric heater in Monchegorsk, Kola Peninsula. So I, you know, put it out to my subs, everybody. I said, hey, holler at your boy. Um, let me know if you can find something I haven't. And what's ironic about it was um, right at the end of the video, I started flipping on other layers in Climate Viewer 3D. And the answer was right there at the end of the video. And I'm pretty certain now um, I'm almost positive that this is the place in question. Um, even though when I went to, you know, um, Google Scholar to look for this, I found this book called Ionospheric Modification by High Powered Radio Waves. And in the citation, it says used commercial transmitter Radio Moscow in Montegorsk to conduct ionosphere stimulation experiments at night. Um, I'm pretty freaking certain that what we're looking for is not Radio Moscow and is a, it actually a Russian military um, missile defense radar. And it's on my map. And I also mentioned Wikimapia. We'll get to that as well. But let's go over here to Climate Viewer 3D. Oh, wait a minute. It's not looking very 3D right now. It's looking kind of flat. Why is my world flat right now? Something is very flat about this. Well, I just want to say this. Give a little toss out, a little shout out to those who would say, like somebody who commented in a video yesterday, you know, I would support you, Jim, if you just weren't so mean to the flat earthers. I'm going to point out something very clearly. A, this map is currently flat. If you like flat, you do flat. You do you, I'm going to do me. Um, but what you're not going to see is me going to other flat earth videos and debunking them commenting on them i do not care if you believe the world is flat i do not you know have any you know dog in that race i do not give one f about your opinion on whether the world is flat or round um i respect your right to disagree with me but this world right here, this 3D globe, happens to be round. And if that triggers you into coming to my video to attack me because I'm even showing a round world in my intro, in my 3D website, or if I mention the word satellite and flat earthers come out of the woodworks like cockroaches scurrying at night to attack me, expect me to re return fire in kind so i respect is not you know just free it is earned and mutual respect will be given so if you come to my videos and you can respect the fact that this may be a round globe that i'm displaying this crap on um without getting triggered and attacking me as a globe tard then you will not ever hear me talking about you being a flat earth retard. Let's move on. Um, I don't know why they're so triggered, Jill. Um, it just, you know, I respect your right to be ignorant and I respect your right to call me ignorant. So we, the day we all agree is the day we could all be wrong. And I will leave it at that. Um, but there we go. So I was looking into this Norway spiral feature which, you know, basically occurred in this region right here. And that paper, the one that we were talking about, mentions 
by name, Montagorsk, right here, okay? So I went and I dug deep into my all of my layers, and now I've added more to this. And what you see here now on the screen may seem very complicated. It's because it is. And most of you probably don't even know this is even on Climate Viewer. But right now I have up four maps. Fortress Russia, air defense radar, and surface-to-air missile sites. Missile defense radars, Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative, and the Space Fence. Surface-to-air missile sites worldwide. And HARP and the ionospheric heaters worldwide. Now, the reason I built Climate Viewer 3D was to overlay multiple data sets to be able to track down things like this. Um, <laughs> it's shaped like Neil deGrasse Tyson. <laughs> I mean, even he says it's not round. He says it's more pear-shaped. <laughs> Don't get me started. Chat, y'all killing me right now. Killing me. So you come in here, and I'm looking at... um. A comment that I actually got and you know what I should probably bring that up so let's just go back over here and I'll pop back over to here and because I don't have a bookmark I'll go to my last video and then I won't play that but I'll scroll down and somebody emailed me this and it says I wrote Intel received via email um, and this is from Russia discovery.com travel guides Kola Peninsula and um, so what are those Area 51 of the Kola Peninsula like? Um, these are, oh God, no, see, I went too far. I, I zoomed too far. No, no wrong way. No, Ma major fails, major. Oh, come on. You could, oh, there, oh, I got it. I got it. I got it. Everybody calm down. I fixed it. Um. Looks like there's some areas, so deep dive on them a little. Um, area 51 of the Kola Peninsula, 10 ki kilometers of the coastline from Cape Crestavi to the Ver Veronia River. Um, areas west of the Ver Veronia uh, River between uh, Tamani Kola Highway and the Kola Pachanga Railway, yada, yada, yada. These are off limits. In addition to these, Russia has 38 closed towns, six of them um, in Murmansk Oblast, which is the area we're talking about. Since all of them contain highly classified military facilities of the Russian Navy, visiting these are, is out of the question, and they are not particularly appealing for touristic purposes anyway. Hell, I'd like to tour that. That'd be pretty interesting. But me and Russia? Never going to happen. So <laughs> don't, don't expect that video, people. Not coming. Um, but anyway, so I was looking at the Kola Peninsula and I said, well, clearly if there are these Area 51 like locations, then they would be defended by surface to air missiles. So what I did was I brought up my surface to air missile map. And as you can see, clearly there are some areas of interest up here because why would you need that many damn missiles um, if you weren't protecting something? And as you can see, the, these are the actual surface-to-air missile radar sites, the yellow ones marked here. All of these triangles are actual missile locations. Um, and you can see those there. But the, 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 the place we're looking for clearly was right here. And it is the R01 Olengorsk 1 in Kola Peninsula. So um, let's just do Monchegorsk. Olengorsk, Olengorsk radar station, which is located near Olengorsk in Kola Peninsula. Okay, um, so this is what we're actually looking for. This is what we've been trying to find. Um, and I'm pretty certain that this is the place um, because there's nothing else in the area. It's even comparable, compatible, um, even close to what we're looking for. So I'm pretty certain that this is our radar um <clears throat> that was mentioned in the ionospheric heaters um document and this is what they're talking about so what we're talking about is a denester m radar um and i went to wikimapia because what i love about wikimapia is it's like what google earth was before they censored the hell out of it and it allows people in an open source fashion to upload photos of locations the government doesn't like photos um, appearing. 
So I've actually got some photos of that now and you can see it here. Um, so these are the photos that they have. Um, going back to some really old ones, there's the Daryl radar that works with the D-Nester. Um, and it looks like this. Oh, by the way, it doesn't look so, so high tech right now. Believe it or not, this is still operational. Um, yeah, it's missing some panels, but um, <laughs> of course, you know, in or, uh, 1991, when this thing was re referenced to be, um, you know, operating as a freaking harp, that basically, you know, it probably didn't look this bad. Um, but regardless, it's being replaced. So these D-Nester radars, they look like this. Um, they're also referred to as the hen house. Um, this is what a, you know, CIA, you know, drawing of what it should look like um, looks. Yeah, um, you know, it's it's an ancient radar. Let's just put it that way. But this is what they were probably referring to in that article um, as the ionospheric heater. And <clears throat> this is where we really have to ask the question. Well, what's the difference between an ionospheric heater and a missile defense radar? And the answer is simply not much at all. Both are high powered. You know, when I say microwave, you know, of course, there's going to be your scientist nuts out there who, you know, who are going to go, they're not microwave. Some of them are VHF. Some of them are UHF. Some of them are HF, meaning high frequency, ultra high frequency, um, very high frequency. So there's different frequencies for these. But the thing they have in common is that they're able to focus their energy in a tight location. In the case of these radars, their purpose was to find incoming ballistic missiles. So they're nuclear first alert radars. Okay. <clears throat> if we go back to climateviewer.com and then I scroll out, what you're going to see is, and I'm going to turn off the surface to air missiles right now, because clearly that's really mucking up the map. So let's clear those out. All of the black radars you see here are American, um, you know, early warning detection, uh, for nuclear Holocaust. <laughs> um, uh, right across here is the space fence. So you can actually see these. It's called Navspasur. This is at Kickapoo, Texas. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, in Jordan, Alabama, Le Jordan Lake, Alabama. Um, let me actually zoom this in real quick because I want you to see this next one. But this one down here is at Eglin Air Force Base. Now, I want to give you this question. Let me get my face out of the way so you can actually see it. Um, Harp is up here in Gakona, Alaska, okay? This is HARP. It is 3.6 million watts, or 3,600,000 watts. It operates on a frequency of 2.8 to 10 megahertz. 180 cross dipole antennas, um, and that's what it looks like, okay? I could zoom in on it if you want me to. I will. Um, let's just not do that. Oh, that, that. That went horribly bad. But regardless, you can come in here and look at it yourself. So for those who don't know what HARP is, it looks like this. That's the field of HARP array antennas. These are what they look like in the picture right here. That's HARP. There's only one HARP in the world, even though I called it a Russian HARP. I want to be very clear about that. Only one HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. And the antennas aren't even called HARP. All of this facility is called HARP. So that's the big difference. Um, the actual instrument is called the IRI or the ionospheric research instrument. Regardless, um, let's go back here and I want you to compare that now 3.6 million watts versus the ANFPS 85 at Eglin Air Force Base from the 20th Space Control Squadron, which is probably now Space Force. Um, 32 million watts which do you think is more powerful 3.6 or 32 million watts now i want you to think about all of these harp um 
Industrial Crow, just to be clear, for those who are wondering, um, the question asked in chat is, isn't Harp defunct? No, it is not. Harp was sold to the University of Alaska Fairbanks. They bought it and they are now renting it out to other scientists, universities, whoever. Whoever's got the money to turn the diesel engines on, um, the angels, as they're called, the engines that run Harp. If you're willing to pay the money to rent out Harp, you can go to the University of Alaska Fairbanks and rent Harp. It is still operational. Um, they still haven't got it back to full power like it was when the United States Naval uh, Research Lab and the U.S. Air Force Research Lab um, were running it, but um, it's mostly um, capable. But regardless, let's still let's still entertain the question. Which do you think? Because all we hear about is harp. I mean, that's all we ever hear about. And then uh, you know, of course, what prompted this video was the idea that there could be a harp in the Kola Peninsula. So the question remains, and this has always been my question and why I spent so much time mapping out all these damn radars. And you can go down all the way to the ground and see that, you know, I didn't just randomly put dots on a map. That is the radar. There is the photo. You know, this took years to make these maps that I made. Okay. So 32 million watts. It is a phased array antenna. It's exactly the same as the HARP facility, except it's used for space surveillance network. It is used for finding satellites in space. It is used to detect nuclear missiles. So you tell me, what's the difference? I have read numerous papers on air glow occurring above missile defense radars. What does HARP do? HARP dumps a bunch of energy into space and then creates artificial air glow. What's the difference? The difference is that HARP, they say it is for ionospheric modification, for space weather modification. Missile defense radars, they say they're for national security. They are for protecting us from missiles and space shit. So, at the end of the day, both are exactly the same technology. They just say it's for a different purpose. Um, you're not going to see scientists being able to go to the ANFPS-85 at Eglin Air Force Base and practice screwing with the ionosphere. That doesn't mean that the United States military doesn't do that because if they did, it'd be top secret anyway. The same is true of the Russian military. The same is true of the Chinese military. I mentioned these three because they happen to have the most money to throw away on big radars and 32 million watt sky heaters. So my original question was, what is the to sum total output of all of these massive microwaves around the globe and what's their effect on climate, on temperature, on weather, all of these things. I've never seen, and you know, I've talked to numerous scientists about this. Nobody's ever even, you know, really quantified it. Um, we don't have a number. And of course their, their counter argument is, well, you know, the sun is, x million watts per square inch you know on the ionosphere so what we're doing down here is minimal and it doesn't have you know nothing to see here uh jim i don't know why you're even talking about it um but at the end of the day it's still a question that haunts me i i you know i go to i say to myself um <clears throat> you know what's the deal you know what what can we actually expect out of these ionospheric heaters you know these freaking missile defense radars all around the world and what's their effect on our climate because i'd like to know um you know inquiring minds want to know um and i've been asking this for quite some time uh i still haven't got an actual answer and maybe somebody can find me some good research on this you know subject let, let me know in the comments let me know via emails i got a flood of emails over the last video and i really appreciate everybody who reached out to me 
Um, it was very informative and, um, I'm actually digging for something in my own articles real quick because it just struck a chord with me. It resonated with me and I wanted to see if I could find it real quick. And there it is. And this is, uh, I don't know why this just popped into my head because I I've asked this question for a long time. What's cooking our planet in 2016? This is, <laughs> it just, I mean, wow. Time flies, man. That's over six years ago, almost. Um, and the question remains, you know, as all of these microwaves are going up and hitting the top of our atmosphere and reflecting back down and passing through clouds and being absorbed by water vapor, what is the sum total effect of this? I want to know, you know, um, and that's why I've mapped all these things out. So let's tie a bow on this thing real quick. So in summary, this ionospheric heater that we were looking for in the last video more than likely is the D-Nester M at the Olengorsk radar station, which looks like this, codename Hen House, um, which is an older style radar. Um, it, it was upgraded to what's called the Daryal um, facility where they use two incongruity. You could see that on the map. Here, um, if I close this out, let me close that. You can actually see on the facility map, you got the two main radars here and here, and then the Daryl um, or Dagava radar down here. Um, and it works together. So this is like a listening post for these transmitters right here. All together, this is the Denester DNEPR, Denepper, um, <clears throat> pick your poison, um, that is probably like, what what they were talking about when they were referencing this and scientists do this all the time they don't do the due diligence to actually look shit up um they they cheat sheet on um, gps locations all the time um you know when i was looking for all these radars they would you know i would see 20 different scientific papers referencing the same ionospheric heater or iscat facility and they would all have different numbers and none of them would be even close to where it actually was when I would go into Google Earth and try to hunt the damn thing down. Um, but that's no surprise to me. Um, so once again, I think this is a case of um, they cheat cheated their way through it and they didn't really want to get into great detail about it. They were just busy writing their paper and, you know, getting done, getting it published out there. So that's where that's the facility um we've gone over that um it's the upgraded and this is what the actual upgraded daryl um daryl or daryl i'm just gonna call it daryl this is the one at pachora um <clears throat> looks like but all of these are being um replaced not gonna even talk about your tux um irkutsk um Although it's mighty fascinating they got an incoherent scatter radar it's another one of these that are just like uh, what we're talking about it's a you know over the horizon radar that doubles as a freaking ionospheric heater which is why it is in my ionospheric heater map um and i have it right here irkutsk and you can see it's right here oh wait it is slap dab in the middle of a bunch of these other you know um v-shaped radars that are very similar to the ones we were looking at earlier so um, more ballistic missile defense radars in Russia and slap dab in the middle of it is the Irkutsk incoherent scatter radar, which is an ionospheric heater with a horn. Um, I come from the Karsteria world. Just so you know, if you put a speaker inside a horn, it can really amplify it. And that's what makes this one unique is that it is a harp in a horn. Pretty fascinating crap. I'm nerding out over here. Okay, guys. You, you know, if, if you're not into this nerdy, sciencey stuff, um, this is the channel for you. This is, uh, you know, let's get nerdy. Because he's just so white and nerdy. Anyway, where are my Weird Al fans at? Um, so these are all being replaced right now by what's called the Varenza radar. Um, or Voronez radar. Excuse me. I always, in my head, it's Varenza but it's Voronez radars. And these things are the current um, state-of-the-art for Russia 
course, uh, Russia got its ass kicked and fell apart. And so did all of their old, you know, radars like the one that we were looking at earlier. But now they're starting to upgrade all their stuff again. And they've got, you know, a couple of these things planned out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten total. Um, I think a couple have been built. But regardless, they're all planned out. But this is what the new state of the art for them looked like. Um, as you can see here, lots of pictures of that. It is basically like a harp. It is like the ANFPS 85 we were looking at earlier, but tilted on its side. It is very similar to the Duga radar at Chernobyl. The one that's been featured in all the video games. The one that was accused of doing weather warfare over America. Um, that radar. So you have all of your cross dipole antennas basically tilted on a side so they can focus all of that, you know, microwave energy in one direction and point it, you know, in a wide um, cone. And as you can see on Climate Viewer 3D, I show what those cones are in this. Um, as you can see here, like these are the cones of where these radars reach. Pretty big freaking cones. Um, actually pretty insane when you think about it that something up here can broadcast and see that wide i mean look at that look at that cone that one radar is literally scanning that much of the sky that's insane to me um the woodpecker correct to suspicious by nature in chad the duga 3 radar in chernobyl is also known as the woodpecker um and it's right here that's the Duga 3 Steel Yard West receiver. And that is the Russian Duga 3 right there. And you guys have probably all seen that. Um, but anyway, kudos to the chat -ter, um, for knowing for nerding out and knowing that I'm talking about the woodpecker. Um, <laughs> so yeah, these things are getting upgraded. Um, so expect big Russian radars to show up on the map as they're being built. Um, I was looking these up earlier, and as you can see right here is a Varenza radar, or Voronez radar, and it's actually under construction. This is the latest imagery from Google Earth, um, from the Google satellites. And of course, you know, right here is where they couldn't get a shot, because as these satellites pass over, they can only take pictures in strips. Um, so I guess once it's actually built, we'll actually have a, a shot of this. You can actually go to the timeline on this and see the date that this was shot. This was shot um, in 2016. So actually, this is some old satellite photography and may already be um, built. Um, but you can go back in time and see, uh, well, they didn't have anything here. Um, and then you flip forward. They've got 1985 and then another shot in 2016. So satellite imagery, tough to find. Um It'd be pretty interesting to, if we could crowdsource some flyovers, but I'd probably end up um, in a CIA detention facility. So let's just avoid that altogether and wrap a bow on this and say, well, damn people, there's a lot of freaking radars out there in the world. And if you want to see all of them, come over to climateviewer.org. It's under the categories, two different categories that um, these maps are in. Atmospheric sensors, it's under history and science, and then atmospheric sensors and EMF sites and government. That's where I put these two categories, and you can find them over here in the map list. Um, in the same categories, you can do this. Just click history and science, click on atmospheric sensors and EMF sites, and scroll down until you see the Fortress Russia, the ionospheric heaters, um, and the surface air missiles and uh, Moscow radar stuff is over there. Um, but interestingly enough, I'll show you one more for the road because, man, this one's cool looking. Look at that big beast of a freaking radar. OMG. <clears throat> this is the Don 2N um, radar in the heart of Russia, surrounded by all of these missile defense radars. And all of the, you wouldn't believe how many freaking missiles are on here. I'm not going to turn that back on. But boy, that is a creepy looking starship, you know, Death Star looking radar facility. Big freaking square. Points in all four directions simultaneously. Um, 
do one on Australia, Jim. One for the road. One request for the road. Let's hop down to Australia and look at the Jorn facilities since we're already talking about it. Um, and we'll go down here. So in, <clears throat> in Australia, we have what's called the Jindali Operational Radar Network. And you can see those here, Jindali Operational Radar Network. And where they, um, you know, they're cones of coverage, basically. Of course, they're all pointed at China. Um, <laughs> my ears are ringing just looking at it. Yeah, if, if you're experiencing tinnitus and you live near one of these facilities, do not be surprised. Um, but yeah, this is this is the the entire map of Australian facilities. So I will bring the zoom back down to life and we'll just quickly rip through those. Um, because if you go to the list right here on the side, you can actually click on them and it'll fly right to them. So this is uh, the Jindali Operational Radar Network at Long Reach, the transmission site where you can see the facility here and how they go. And I got some photos of it right here. So you can see the actual photos of the facility. Um, they basically look like this. Um, big poles, lots of wires. Um, that's how um, they do it down under, um, which of course just screwed up my zoom. Coming back, um, Jindalee at Queensland, also Stonehenge, this facility, which they're actually labeled on freaking Bing Maps now, which is, uh, I mean, just monumentally different from when I was looking all of these things up. There was nothing. I can promise you there was nothing anywhere you had to, I mean, I had to hunt so hard for these. I mean, it literally is labeled on being maps. That is freaking impressive. <laughs> Microsoft be looking at my stuff and like, yo, we should just type that in there. I mean, it's already out there, right? Um, but, you know, I, I coded each one of these map dots like a web page. So they have references on the side that you can click. And you can go to, you know, um, what the hell? What the absolute hell? Um, I mean, uh, uh, uh. throw an L on the end of that. And this is at the Living Moon, um, 45 Jack Files. And, you know, I found most of these from this guy. So like to give credit where credit is due, give it up for the living moon for helping me find all of these Jindalee operational radar network Jorn sites in Australia. And uh, now they have really high resolution photos of them. They did not. So this is actually a refresher for me. Um, but these are the missile defense radars all over um, Australia. And as you can see, they're rather large. Zoom out, zoom out. Why are you being such a dick? Um, a lot. There you go. Thank you. Like stuck, like Chuck. Um, and they're you know they're all around. And the Humpty Doo Transmit um Center, which I think is just the funniest name ever. I don't, I don't know. Am I just being childish about this? Humpty Doo. <laughs> Pretty fun stuff. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of these, the Jorn transponders. These are listening stations for them. So then after they have the transmit stations, they have these listening stations all over Christmas Island, Horn Island, um, Jorn coordination center. So this is actually where they run everything from. I nerded out that far, but there you go. One last request for the road. Um, we just went down under um, and I didn't even grab you by the... Cajones, Bajones. Um, I'm going to keep it clean. Let's keep this family friendly. People, it's your dirty mouths. All right, well, I think problem solved. I'm going to tie a bow on that one. A, the Norway spiral was caused by a rocket that spiraled out of control. B, the colors you saw were because of the rocket exhaust um, interacting with upper atmospheric conditions and winds. Um See, the, the paper we were talking about in the previous video mentioned a uh, ionospheric heater on the Kola Peninsula in Russia. It was, in all likelihood, a denester, um, older-style radar um, 
that was for anti-ballistic missile defense systems. And the question of the day remains, what's the difference between a HARP, an ionospheric heater, and a missile defense radar? And I would argue not much, just what they say, um, you know, it, what it's used for. Um, last question of the day, does Dominic still have a YouTube channel? Dominic uh, Marama, you know, created all of the newspaper articles on um, uh, weathermodificationhistory.com. And because he's a great graphics artist, I encouraged him to get into 3D. And um, <clears throat> I'm just going to, you know what? Since we since you brought him up, I'm gonna give a shout out to my boy. Okay. So Dominic created uh Weather Modification History's newspaper articles. Um, I'm gonna bring those up just real quick and give me one second. So we go over here to weathermodificationhistory.com, and you can actually see um the you know the timeline and all that. You can click through those all the timeline entries view the actual timeline that has all the different events going back to 1800 but up here at the very top is newspapers or on the front page if you just scroll down a little bit further it says weather modification news vault created by dominic marama right here um load up i'm really overworking my internet so that's dominic for those who don't know him um clearly uh Suspicious by nature is a uh, asked a great question because Dominic is my friend. We talk regularly, um, always will be. But Dominic is such a good graphics artist. I encouraged him to get into 3D graphics. <clears throat> and for the past three years, he has been practicing practicing his ass off um, using Blender. And Blender is an open source 3D graphics software. Um, I had a previous history where I was using 3D Studio Max, Lightwave, and Maya to create video game graphics. I created maps for Rainbow Six Rogue Spear and Unreal Tournament 2003. Um, so I used the Unreal Engine. I used 3D Studio Max to create maps for video games. I still play video games. And I told Dominic, you know, why don't you get into this? So. Dominic's moved on from doing sign graphics and making all of these beautiful renderings of all of these newspaper articles, over 800 newspaper articles on weathermodificationhistory.com. You can't find these anywhere else in the world. They are freaking priceless. And by priceless, I'm talking, this is a big ass image. You have no idea. Open image in new tab. We're talking about that big. And I mean, really big. Uh, it's not even zoomed all the way in. This is zoomed all the way in. And um, so he rendered these at extremely high resolutions. And you can go in and read. I mean, you can count every single one of the freaking dots on Tesla's face right there. Um, so that you can read the original articles and all of that. So what is Dominic up to now? He does still have a YouTube channel. Um, but he's over on artstation.com slash stormfury101. Um, check him out, Dominic Marama on artstation.com slash stormfury101. His YouTube channel also has um, some of the, uh, he put a mature content flag on his cannabis plant he just rendered. Um, but you can see all of his 3D renderings right here. Just phenomenal stuff. Um, this is his YouTube channel now showing uh, one of his animations he just did um, using depth field with beautiful freaking, you know, rocking animation on this boat, model all of this in 3D. Um, you can see it fully rendered here. You can see it in lower resolution here you know, without all of the texture mapping filtering here and in just r raw polygon um, or mesh format here so that you can see the entire process. But yeah, Dominic's making some absolutely beautiful artwork right now and he's still at it. Um, and I think, that, I mean, just some of these things that he's doing are just impressive. I mean, look at that. He rendered that in freaking Blender. Um, 
I'm going to be honest with you. I, I was never that good. <laughs> but then again, back when I was doing it in 2000, um, the pro the computers could barely run 3d studio max and ray tracing on this level was still being dreamed about um so i you know big ups to my boy um he's got major freaking skills and he's doing the damn thing he's gotten several contracts with very large companies which i you know hope to be able to talk about in the future but let's just say my boy's getting paid and he's doing things for companies that would blow your mind, um, you know, rendering out pretty awesome stuff. And that's what that's what Dominic be doing. Um, that looks pretty damn good. I mean, that's pretty photorealistic and um, big, big ups to Dom. Dom's killing it. So that's where Dominic is. And um you know, if, if you guys haven't ever checked it out, if you're into the whole 3D thing, check out Blender. Blender is absolutely amazing. He did send me a series of tutorials to watch so that I could get up to date on it. You know how busy I am. And if I dive into Blender right now, I swear I will lose my mind with it. And that will be what I'm doing. Um, but I do have dreams of, you know, doing things like modeling the entire heart facility and all of the ionospheric heaters. But that could really open a can of worms that I might not be able to put back together. Um, although I did, you know, make one small request of Dom. And I said, um, Dom, could you at least throw me one harp antenna in this shot? And he did do that. And you can see it right here. Um pretty freaking awesome and it's uh right here that is a harp antenna right in the middle of a cyberpunk landscape that he did so thank you dom love you mean it brother <laughs> pretty awesome stuff um man well we went all over the place with that and um I love you guys. I mean it. If you're watching this somewhere else on, um, you know, one of my other channels or if somebody's downloaded this video because I make all my videos creative commons, please come back over to YouTube, look up climate viewer on YouTube or type this long URL in and hit that subscribe button. Um, you know, gently smush the like button, click the bell. It may work. Apparently it, you know, somebody got a notification today. So something's going really crazy over at YouTube. I can't explain it. Um, so you may get a notification and if you could, you know, support me monthly on Patreon, um, you, you also get a discount on merch. I'm going to be sending out a newsletter to my own, only my Patreons from now on. So if you previously signed up for the newsletter, um, that thing's a thing of the past because it's just too much. Um, but for my patrons, I am going to be adding that to all the different patron levels that, um, everybody, whether you're at the $2 level or top end is going to be getting a weekly newsletter that's going to have all the things I do. If I'm on podcasts, if I'm doing all of the videos from the week, so you will get a notification in your inbox. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. Or if you want to just give a one-time donation, um, PayPal or GoFundMe, you can always hit me up there. I greatly appreciate everybody who's supported me. And um, thank you for sticking through this long video. You guys who make it to the end, you're the best um, because you're nerdy like me. Apparently you're into this thing because um, I'm just not that interesting. <laughs> and I, I know I'm not, you know, it's, you're not here for the sex appeal, although you might be. Hey, now. Um, but regardless, I had fun making this video with you guys and you guys always keep me going. So I really appreciate everybody who subscribed and supported me and sharing is caring. So please share this video out. Um, maybe somebody, you know, the next time you're talking to them and somebody brings up the Norway spiral, you can go, Hey, you know, that's this, and this is why, um, and with this information comes power and with power comes great responsibility. Not that they say things like it's a freaking wormhole or, you know, any of those other things I'm not going to say, <laughs> um, but use that information to attack ideas, not people. Wonderful day.